So I'm in a different location right now. I just had my new couch delivered. Here's a picture. And I have to admit, this is the most expensive, nicest piece of furniture I've ever bought, brand new. And neither my husband or I have ever had anything like this. It's a power reclining sofa. And I'm gonna try not to play with it because I don't wanna break it in less than a week. <laughs> but here's here's what the buttons do. And I'm like, at first I felt guilty. Don't I, can I, you know, recline my own self instead of having power buttons? But I don't care. I mean, I, I just don't care. Hey everybody, it's Kim at Middle of the Book March. This is my bookish week for Saturday, April 9th. And yes, I have a new couch. It just got delivered. My old couch was so ripped up and ratty from cats and pet hair and kid. And we actually had them uh, dispose of the old one. <laughs> the amount of pieces of food and crumbs and popcorn and Skittles that they pulled up, not they, that I pulled out of the couch trying to clean it. And then as they were moving the couch out the door, two forks fell out of it. <laughs> and I'm like, really? Forks? Oh, and I found a half-drunk bottle of Sprite in there, too. Fortunately, that didn't leak at all. And I don't know how long that was there. I don't know. It was pretty gross. So, I have a super sweet, comfy piece of furniture. And I am just so looking forward to spending time on my couch all weekend. So, anyway, that's the new location. I'm not going to be here every time I make a video. But, um, I've actually, beyond the couch, I've had a lot of family stuff going on, so my reading has slowed down a little bit. So, I've got two books to tell you about, and I'm currently reading three. Yeah, I think I'm, well, I'm reading th four. The first one I finished was an abridged version of The Stranger Beside Me by Anne Rule. And this was the 1980 true crime um, book about Ted Bundy. Uh, Ted Bundy was executed in 1989, I believe in Florida State Prison. And Anne Rule was a personal friend of his it, when he was in his early 20s, long before his, his serial killing spree. And she became friends. She was not in his age bracket. She was not the same type of person. She was a, a mother with, with kids. And her own personal description of herself was she was kind of dowdy. And she was approaching middle age. And Ted Bundy was in his early 20s in a work-study program working as a telephone answer person on a crisis hotline along with Anne Rule. So for whatever reason, they got to know each other and they kept in touch over the years for many, many years and until his execution. So she wrote this book and as I said, I listened to it on audio, but it was the abridged version. Fortunately, she narrated it. So it was really interesting to hear all of the information in her tone, her voice. Um, and I was just fascinated. So any of us who live in the U.S., um, even even young people, pretty much know who Ted Bundy was and what he did. He was a prolific serial killer of w young women, starting in the 70s, I believe. And uh, he had a type, and he had um, really interesting ways of luring young women um, by being super friendly and by asking for their help. He was uh, very good looking, so he was approachable and very polite, extremely smart, and psychopathic. Um, I've, I remember being at work listening to the radio at the report when he was executed. They reported live immediately after his death, after he was declared deceased. And I remember standing with several other co-workers just listening to that broadcast on the radio. And so we all knew what Ted Bundy did, but what, what I didn't realize and I learned from the book was how violent he actually was and how, what he did to these women. And this is not a book that's easy to listen to and it's not a book that, you know, a lot of people are going to rush out to read. There are a lot of people who don't like reading about serial killers and true crime, but this was fascinating. And this is to his his name has kind of become a, a cultural definition and um 
I was just, it was fascinating. Anne Rule, uh, she's since passed away, but she was one of the most prolific and most famous true crime writers out there. And this book was not the first true crime book, um, but it was one of the most famous. And it was uh, most likely her most famous book. So it was fascinating. It was absolutely horrifying. Um, such an incredible psychological study. And even in the abridged version, I actually was going to go back and listen to the regular length version, and I started to do that. But then I realized I think I captured everything in the abridged version, so I was I was satisfied with that one. Um, but it, it was an excellent book, and I actually am interested in reading more of her work. Um, I don't think I'll do it right away because I don't want to read one book about a serial killer after another after another, if you know what I mean. So I finished one other book since the last time I did a video, and this book was an example of a book that I was listening to on audio, which was spectacular, and I needed to buy the physical copy because I needed to have this in my library. And this is A Ghost in the Throat by, by Doreen Negrifa, an Irish poet and author. Um, I was contemplating doing a full-length review on this book, but I don't enjoy doing those at all, so I'm going to pass. However, I do want to talk about this book. Uh, Negrifa is a poet, and this book is a combination of memoir and a fictionalized account of a historic Irish poet that Negrifa researched and tried to find the history of. And she she provides the some aspects of this woman's real life and history, but she has to fictionalize and invent so much of her story. The poet she discovered was Eileen Dove, an Irish poet from the 1700s. Uh, yeah, 18th century. And she came across an epic Keen poem, which is a poem that uh, Eileen Dove wrote after the murder of her husband. And it was a grief poem, very long, very emotional. And at the, at the, at the murder of her husband, uh, Eileen Dove got word from a messenger and she rushed to the scene of her husband's murder. And at his death, was scooping handfuls of his blood and drinking his blood. And it was an interesting scene, an interesting poem, an interesting collection of her emotions. Now, De Grifa in the contemporary time period is a mother with several, uh, three young children at home and pregnant with her fourth. Um, and her fourth turns out to be a daughter. She is, she is, writing her memoir of her life in in her family, the the role of taking care of her children full time and being a homemaker. She takes an enormous amount of pride and um, importance in that role. And she's interesting because she writes about it in a very methodical way and how much she loves the everyday mundane tasks of being a mother and a homemaker. She loves lists. She loves checking her tasks off on a list, whether she's hoovering, vacuuming, whether she's washing dishes, feeding children, cleaning up after children. There's an, uh, a great length of discussion on breastfeeding and her experiences with breastfeeding. She also um, pumps in order to produce extra milk to donate it to um, charities that give breast milk to babies who cannot get it from their own mothers or from adoptive mothers or that type of thing. So to her, that's that's life-giving and it's part of what gives her purpose. The, the interesting thing is when she discovers Eileen Dove, she also talks about the research into her life also gives her another type of purpose, an intellectual literary purpose. And it's so interesting how she links those two parts of her life together. Because she's a poet, the memoir and the fictionalized account of Eileen Dove's life is extraordinary. The language is gorgeous. It is emotional, powerful. Uh, the way she strung words and sentences together was just, I, I could use the word flowing, but I think that's too undramatic of a word to use. It is so gloriously written. And I think I'm going to do a little bit of woman splaining to talk about the connections and why this was so extraordinary to me. Because she 
lives for her family. She lives for the importance her role is in her life and her family. She takes a great deal of mountainous importance in what she's doing. And she derives so much, so much satisfaction with being a, a homemaker and providing milk for babies who need breast milk. It's just the strength of her convictions and the strength of her purpose and how she talks about that is tremendous. The connection that she makes between her life and her research into Eileen Dove it's not that she's minimizing the the vacuuming and the cleaning and the feeding and all of that, but she realizes, oh my gosh, there are full grown turkeys in my front yard. There's a whole flock of turkeys walking across my front yard. This is awesome. One of them staring right at me through the window. Holy cow. Ah, I love it. Sorry, I couldn't, sorry. <laughs> This flock appears in my neighborhood often, and in the middle of winter, I'm totally going off track, but in the middle of winter, they've been in my backyard, and there's two great big toms who are all puffed out, protecting the rest of the flock. So I just love it. I love the animals that appear in my yard. So going back to this, uh, Nagriffa derives the same amount of purpose in taking care of her family versus doing the research into Eileen Dove's life. Because what she's doing is she's trying to track down all of the details of this woman's history and can't find what she's looking for. And she is very clear in defining what happens to women in history. Our, our lives are not documented. Our lives are not important enough for historians to document and to list. And that's what she wants to know. She wants to know who Eileen Dove was. She wants to know how what role she played in her family, what was it like for her as a mother, as a wife, as a young Irish woman? She wants to know what Eileen Dove's life as a wife, as a mother, as a widow was like. She wants the history. She wants to document the history. And she is very clear to the reader that women are just erased. All right, I got a phone call and I forgot where I was. This, this video is going to be a hot mess. So, okay, I was talking about women's history. In the, the history of history, does that make sense? Women were not thought of as important enough to remember. And that's what Nagriffa is saying in her, her researching and her processing of Eileen Dove's life. So I've watched other reviews on BookTube and I've, I've read reviews who really don't know why this book has struck so many people so powerfully. And that's what I wanted to discuss. And that is why is the, the power of women in everyday life, the lack of history, the lack of importance given to women, and this, her powerful voice talking about and not justifying, but simply putting on display the strength of the role of women in motherhood, in literature, in marriage, and in whatever purpose they find to work on, to devote themselves to, the level of devotion of women and the level of importance women want to give to each other. That's, I think, the strength of the book. And the writing le lends to the power of the content. So the words track the level of importance of the content of her book and the, the content, her, the power of her words. It is such an extraordinary book one of the best memoirs I think I've read, and the audio is absolutely spectacular. Um, this was a five-star book for me, and I highly recommend it. If you love poetic writing, if you are a fan of poetry, but you are also a fan of memoir and women's history, absolutely pick up A Ghost in the Throat. So those are the two books that I finished. What am I currently reading? I am currently reading on my Kindle, The Animals in That Country by Laura Jean McKay. And I'm very, I think I'm about a third into this. She is an Australian author and it's set in Australia with a middle-aged woman who works on kind of an anim animal sanctuary. Uh, she's a tour bus operator. She's a drinker. And she wants to become a ranger who's in charge of taking care of the animals. So in the beginning of the book, we're kind of 
you know, going through the quick parts of her story and she has a grown son and a daughter-in-law and a granddaughter that she helps take care of. It's kind of a conflicted relationship with them. And there's also some sort of flu that's happening, which is starting to make it possible for people to understand animals. So that's all I know of that book so far. So far, I'm really enjoying it. I am about a third of the way through Lolly Willows by Sylvia Townsend Warner, which I am loving. Uh, this was uh, highly recommended by Britta Bowler and John David, both on BookTube, and I'll put their channels below. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm just loving it. This is the story of Laura Willows, who has to leave her childhood estate after the death of her father. And she goes to live with her brother and sister-in-law and their two daughters when she becomes Aunt Lolly. And this is set in the very beginning of the 20th century, I believe, the end of the 19th, the very beginning of the 20th. And so there's a lot of discussion about the about women, about, uh, you know, the way women needed to take care of their families, at, even as daughters, and the lack of education, and, and what happens once she joins her brother's family. So, so far, the writing is excellent. And I am continuing to work on the Hainish novels of Ursula K. Le Guin. I am still on Planet of Exile. I haven't really been able to pick this one up. I love the stories. It's just I need more headspace to continue to read this one. So um, that's it's there, and I know I'm going to get to it. This is probably going to be a year-long project for me. I definitely wanted to start it and did during March for March of the Mammoths, but I also knew I was never going to finish this whole book in March. So this is going to be um, my project, and we'll see we'll see when I get to it next. Now this is stupid, but I'm also reading another book on my Kindle. It's a cozy mystery, and it's a uh, bookshop murder and I don't remember the title or the author nor did I prepare so I will maybe put a picture here um, and so you can see the author's name the title of the book and it's it's basically set in a very quaint small Massachusetts town there's a very quaint small bookshop a very quaint small bakery quaint small antique store and a quaint small jewelry store and the owner of the bakery comes up murdered dun 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 so, so far I'm enjoying that one and it's a very easy, cozy read. Uh, I, it, I picked it up on a whim because I wanted something light and so far so good. So that's it for me. I am going to um, continue to recline in my sofa and let me know what you think of the books I talked about in the comments below and I'll see you in the next video. Bye everybody.